Hi there, and welcome to the See For Yourself podcast, the podcast where we uh, talk about our expectations for a film, we discuss what the film is supposed to be about according to a small blurb from it, we stop the podcast, go watch the movie, come back and talk about all the things that we were expecting that didn't happen, and all the stuff that we just kind of want to gush about. Uh, I am your host today, uh, Bubba McMindler, and uh, this is my uh, compatriot. I'm uh, John Buscemi, the uh, the actual cross-eyed brother of Steve Buscemi. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was, it was nice of you to, you know, give your brother so much work or vice versa, whichever. I don't know how that's playing. Right. You know, anytime you see him cross-eyed, uh, it's really just me. Like, they couldn't they couldn't CGI that shit in, so I just walk in and I do the cross-eyed bit, and then he, he does the rest of the acting. That brilliant man, that brilliant actor... You guys got to give him more work. Yeah, give him more more acting. To Less cross eyed work because I'm tired. He's he's you know he's got other stuff to do. He's you know a lot of hard work that he puts into his life. Uh, today we are going to be watching uh, uh, House, a 1977 film by Nobuhiko Obayashi. Jesus. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and pull up the little blurb for that. In an effort to avoid spending time with her father and his creepy new lover, young, gorgeous. Which I believe... They capitalized the G. Is her name gorgeous? Well, hold on. Let's try to get through this one. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, resolves to visit her aunt's uh, remote mansion with six of her closest friends in tow, including the musically inclined Melody and the geeky prof. Gorgeous arrives at the estate where supernatural events occur almost immediately. Uh, a severed head takes flight. Uh... Household appliances come to life, and a portrait of a cat seems to contain an evil spirit. Uh, I didn't love that blurb. I feel like those last few sentences probably could have been cut, but you were kind of staring at them, so I figured I would. No, say that's that's fair. I need, I need to in the because I know you've cut off portions of the blurb in the past when they revealed too much. Which I'm kind of glad that I was leaning over reading this because my original question was whether this was the people's names, which I think answered itself. But also, you said that this is like an indie horror film, and this just sounds like a quirky, scary movie ripoff. So it was made in 1977. So uh, this would be before a lot of like the craze for horror films would have been happening. This is very much like in the time of horror films, as like uh, Nosferatu, Dracula, Nosferatu being like one of the oldest horror films you can find. But like that kind of like the horror isn't as visceral and bloody and like that kind of thing. Talking, I'm talking about here. Is there jump scares in this? Because I'm going to be really pissed off if we run into a jump scare. I think that by this time, jump scare had been invented, but was not popularized. Remember, again, like, the way that we know jump scares now being, like, a necessity of horror films is as a result of uh, Bloomhouse. Right. Or Blumhouse, or whatever, however it's pronounced. Blumhouse very much being the place where, like, they're like, hey, the executives of this this production company, we want you to have jump scares. It worked really well in the test group, and we're just going to keep fucking doing yes. it. Yes. Yeah. No, that's, that's fair. Um, and I'm very excited... That this is not one of those because, fuck man, nothing pisses me off more than a jump scare. Do you are there are there any expectations you have for the film other than your un, undying crippling fear of uh, jump scares? Jump scares. Keep uh, in mind this is considered an experimental film. All right, so are we going to go ahead and say that this is not? Is this devoid of humor? No, I mean it's a it's a horror film. Horror typically kind of has a little ha, bit has of its own has its own bit of humor because uh, God, I'm really hoping. That this has actual existential dread. Because whenever I see Supernatural and, oh, the appliances start floating, if we're talking about pure horror, I feel jump scare. And I don't like that. But since we're, we're taking jump scare off the table, I hope there is some solid existential horror. Because I love that and I don't see enough of it. When you say experimental, I really don't know how to take that. It mentioned something about the creepy lover of the, of the, the father and... Mm. What, what, what's that? What's that movie where it's like the lady who's a ventriloquist, like Don't Scream or something like that? Oh, uh, Darkness Falls or Don't Scream. Or... I think I think it's Don't Scream, where um, yeah, where where the the love interest of the patriarch ends up being the uh, the ghost evil thing. Uh, that sounds oh. like something that's gonna happen. God, that movie was almost really really good because if I recall correctly, like she was specifically like. A ventriloquist that would use like a living person basically and just would move their like tendons that, that, and shit. Yeah, that was that was the horror bit at the end. Like by the time the reveal happened, um, the, the the lady there was speaking as the father um, way earlier in the movie. Like that was the big reveal, and I thought that was really cool. 
Yeah, the best parts of that movie is like the big reveal and like specifically how it shows you the way she's like working them like a Yes. Like, there are some times when like showing isn't necessary, and in that case, while it might not have been necessary, and that's up to interpretation. It was thoroughly enjoyable. Really cool. Yeah. No, I I thought that was an awesome film. Still heavy on the jump scares that I didn't like, but like it mattered there because of the don't scream aspect of it. Blah blah blah. Should take your voice or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I was I was more willing to accept that the jump scare had to happen. Even still, you can get people to scream without like a quick and active like thing. You know? A boo boo boo. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm I'm predicting that this this lover is. You know, and they really leaned on supernatural in the blurb. What if it's not supernatural? What if this is all something to scare away the daughter and her friends? And so it's all manufactured by the creepy love interest of the father. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be interesting. Yeah, right? I'd like to see that. I'm, I'm still like fixated on this when you, when you said it, it's experimental horror. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm really excited to see something that is not a jump scare. And when you mentioned like Nosferatu, like. I haven't seen it, but what I know of it is that it was also, like, not big, jump-scary bullshit. And, uh, man, I, apparently old horror just had it. Like, they just they just knew how to pe- make people terrified of the world around them without big, scary booga booga masks. And I think there's a portion of, like, older horror films that's, like, interesting in that it's not necessarily trying to scare you so much as it is trying to be, like, kind of off-putting. Like, oh, God, Nosferatu isn't... It's not that it's, like, scary so much that it's just, like man, this makes me think about things, and, like, that's kind of rough, you know? Like, it makes you think about, like, you know, getting sick and, like, you know, things like that, and and, and that's, like, an interesting aspect of Nosferatu. And it, I don't I don't remember Nosferatu really scaring me so much as it was just kind of, like, this is, like, disturbing and kind of off-putting, and they relied on that in horror. Over Especially, horror like, the, there's the clip everybody can, can like, see in their head, because I think they used it in SpongeBob that one time, where it's just the, the rat face and the, the pale head <laughs> and all that stuff. And it's just an off-putting thing. Um, I think that's what I also like about Lovecraftian stuff like that. And also why I think it's really hard to do in movie format is because, um, you know, when you read the books, it's it's about not knowing and stuff like that. And people have reduced it to being like, oh, Cthulhu, big big tentacle beast. I don't think he's ever described like that in the books, really. All, all the good Lovecraftian horrors are... And we couldn't describe the color, and the angles weren't right, and it was just very much not right, and that feeling of unease and this not being how things are, and that existential dread, like, that's beautiful, and I love feeling that in horror movies, as opposed to, like, and the guy jumped out with an axe. I don't know if we're going to get a whole lot of existential horror in this film. I don't know if it ever comes to that kind of a place. But uh, it certainly does. I think that like sort of feeling of like this is kind of more disturbing than it is scary. I definitely think the movie has a lot of that. I remember uh, there being a lot of scenes in the film that were like, I can't tell if this is supposed to be funny or if it's supposed to be terrifying. And that makes it more scary. I do like that. That like uneasy like connection that we do have, like I mentioned earlier, between like horror and comedy and like kind of weaponizing that against us. Or even like I think it's natural for people to like handle their fears and unease or maybe just that's just something i do where i like weaponize comedy against those things and so for them to mesh the two defeats that as a defense and i think that's really cool yeah yeah uh horror horror movies are a really cool way to explore the way that we engage with the rest of our lives i think that that's something that we don't get enough of unfortunately because of the prevalence of blumhouse movies and like the the fucked up thing is is like i'm pretty sure the uh what are they called? The Conjuring movies are made by Blumhouse. Okay. And that's kind of why they're prevalent is, first of all, like, the Conjuring films are, uh, they're based on, like, a real, like, real life events and stuff and, like, a real ghost hunting couple that, like, wrote about, like, a lot of their stuff uh, that they experienced that was, like, dark and twisted and whatnot. And sure. I imagine if you're in the job of, like, ghost hunting, whether that stuff is real or not, you're going to come across some stuff that's kind of fucked up, right? So that's inherently interesting and is, like, worth making a movie over even if the movie's really not that great. I, I think those kind of situations, like, I, I enjoy seeing those as, like, the, um, I mean, in writing, it's the unreliable narrator, where it's like, I'll, I'll be at home at night, and, like, I'll hear something fall in the kitchen, and I've got cats. Like, surely they knocked something off the table. But that immediate sense of, like, I didn't topple anything over, and nobody's in that room, and that quick feeling, that's pretty neat. I don't know where I was going with that, but, like, oh, yeah, for the ghost hunting bits, like, 
if you're looking for ghosts, like if you're looking for something, you will generally find it. And if somebody's looking for an ethereal explanation for shit going on, you'll find it. I agree. And if you won't find it, you'll find something that feels close enough, right? Sort of like how horoscopes like cast a broad enough net to touch somebody. Um, yeah, if, if you're looking for an ethereal explanation for for something, you know, it, it's not it's not that my my daughter has progressive schizophrenia it's she's hearing voices because somebody was murdered in my house like if you're looking for that explanation you're going to find something in the past of somebody dying near your property you know, what is a confirmation bias yes like i already know what my answer is going to be so whatever the answer comes up as i'm going to designate it as my answer all right um, yeah I, I i agree um i don't think that's 100 percent of it but i do think that's a significant factor and certainly like comes up quite frequently I'm a huge fan of Nobuhiko Obayashi. We talked about him the other day. He he died of cancer just recently. I, I was bragging on him. I didn't mean it. <laughs> he uh, he he was told that he had cancer like in his last year of life, and he was asked if he would like to like stop working so he could like focus on recovery or whatever. And he said no, and then died the following year. And I don't know if like you know focusing on recovery, quote unquote, would have saved him. But like he was already fairly older like when he found out. So like. Uh, I don't know if it would have even been any help. And it's just wonderful to me to think of somebody who's like, yeah, I love filmmaking so much. I'm going to keep doing that till my last day. And I think his last film is like uh, it's sort of a salute to filmmaking. It's like uh, the, the history of cinema or something. like. I can't remember exactly the name of the film, but it's it, it's probably worth looking up because it's apparently just a big love letter to, to movie making. I think that's, um, I mean, less about the movie, but I think that's a super respectable thing to do. I'd like to think that I'd do that. But like if I, if I was told I had a year to live and they're like, so you should probably quit smoking or, or quit drinking. And it's like, you're going to turn my year into a year and a half of boredom. Like I've got a year left. I'm going to blow it up. And this man, this man's version of blowing it up was to continue to do, continue to do his passion. And that's awesome. It makes me think of, uh, Rumiko Takahashi, uh, the lady who made, uh, Inuyasha and Rama one half. Okay. Those are the two works of hers that I'm most familiar with and I think most people have like heard of in some way or another. But um, she was asked in an interview one time uh, if she if reincarnation was real, how would she want to be reincarnated? And uh, she was she responded, I'd like to be a manga artist again. Like, if I could do this all over again, basically, I'd do it exactly how I did it. I love this. This is everything. This is what I want to be. This is what I want to do. And I'm doing it. And that's magical to me. Do you think uh, that guy that did Blame, do you think he'd have a similar answer? Or do you think that like his experience as an architect plays into what he was able to create afterwards? So do, do you think he'd start from the rip being like, if I knew from the beginning that I was going to, what do you call manga cause? The manga cause or manga artist or whatever you want to call um, him. If he, if he knew from the rip that like that's what he would love doing, do you think he'd do the architecture thing again? Do you think it would affect his style? I think it would affect his style. Sutomu so Nihei is, is who we're talking about here. And Sutomu so Nihei... Um, yeah, a lot of his like manga uh, drawing style is dependent on his background in architecture for sure. But uh, I don't know if he would still go through with like being an, an architect. I don't know if he hated it or if he just tolerated it. And like, like, did he do it for the money? Did he get into that like in the way I got into working on cars, where it's like that's the respectable job that'll make you the money? Yeah, I don't know. I, I do not have enough information on that, but um. I do know that he does love being a manga artist. He loves storytelling. He loves visual storytelling specifically. And he wants very, very much for people to learn more about his work and to like experience his work. And I agree, like, of any artist who's ever lived, his work can change storytelling forever. And that doesn't happen very often. There are very few artists who have ever existed who changed storytelling, the way that we tell stories, for forever. Like, for the rest of time, not just like as a fad for the next couple of years, but like now going forward, we will always try to like use the background and use like uh, architecture and like uh, the, the world building through setting. This thing that like uh, Souls like games have been like uh, really leaning on is like not telling the story, but presenting a world and letting you figure out what's going on in it yeah but to do that entirely through pictures and not through like i picked up the sword of light and fire and i read the description on it and the description told me that when gwyn the lord of flames attacked uh, right. the starcifolo the like lord of darkness you know they clashed yeah, that, for a thousand years and like that, that was never my appeal of like the soul's legs either is that like uh 
I wanted to get into Dark Souls because it, uh, the way it was presented to me was very much, this is after the things have happened, and this is the resulting dying world, and I, th- I thought that was really cool. I certainly think that there's a lot of really cool things about the Dark Souls franchise, but like specifically, uh, they certainly do use a lot of like background in order to tell the narrative. Um, but I think the thing I was trying to highlight was that Tsutomu Nihei, a lot of like how you have to understand his narrative is through just like paying attention to the visuals. Um, whereas with Dark Souls, while that's certainly an aspect of it, a lot of the like uh, the, the lore is is explored through the shit you pick up in shit you pick up and you read the description and it tells you directly. Basically, it straight right. up says this guy fought this guy. Oh, okay, so they weren't good friends. I thought maybe they were good friends because in the opening it mentions them as in the same order. Like, and then there was this guy who ruled the world, and then this guy ruled alongside of him, and it's like okay, so they're friends, right? That's an easy assumption to make. Sure. But then you pick up the sword of whatever the fuck, and then you read it, and it says, no, they fought each other a bunch. Oh, okay, so they weren't friends. They were, like, sort of clashing with each other. Oh, okay, cool. While it is certainly an interesting and different way to tell the story, and certainly very unique to the Dark Souls franchise, it's not, like, the same, you know? Right. But it is, it, it, is still- it, it, it bridges on the same idea, but they, they cheat and yeah. actually tell you things. Whereas, like, Nihei, like, even when he does cheat and, like, have a character tell you something specifically, it's still pretty vague. And you do have to like pay attention to everything else and use that to help you to understand. Well, uh, I think that's good enough. Let's just hop on in. Was there anything else you wanted to? Uh, no, no. I, I listed my predictions with what little I know about the movie. Fucking, um, since you picked this movie, it's probably going to be wildly wrong. This is actually about um, the horror of coming out as a homosexual in... When did, where did they make this movie? Japan. Japan. In Japan. Okay. Well, let's, <laughs> yeah, see if, let's see if that pans out. <laughs> And we are back from having watched uh, the movie. Uh, what, 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 are your, what are your thoughts, James? Tell me everything about the movie for you. Go right on ahead. Jump, dive on in. God. Um, no jump scares, or at least what, what they presented as jump scares the few times you brought it up. Definitely not the modern jump scare. So, already, like, we're starting off 10 out of 10. Loved it. I kept on getting to these points where... I felt as if they were going to do the jump scare thing, or they were going to do the loud music thing, and I could feel the tension building up. And then the culmination of that was spoopy skeleton man, like, fucking doing a jig in the background, and I'm like, cool, man. Like, no, that's that's terrifying. And then, like, they've got these girls that are like, hey, hey, did, did she just strip all her clothes off? That's weird. Anyways, and back to normal. And it's like, nobody, like... It, explores the horrific thing that's like, oh my god, she's now in this naked doll. They, even, then they don't. They ignore it entirely. They even point out like, they're like, man, did she strip in here? Look, this doll also stripped, and it's like, put, put it together, <laughs> right, right. Not not even a little bit. And uh, there were so many weird parts. Like in that very same scene, they're like, I found her dress. I found her bra. I found her panties. <sighs> yeah, these are her panties. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god. The the period correct shitty animation that went into the, the fucking piano eating the girl. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I mentioned it looked like a Mortal Kombat scene because like the leg just flies off. Like yep. that that could have fucking been a fatality right there. Yeah. I really like this was funny. This this was a funny movie to me. This definitely felt like scary movie before scary movie had branded itself. Mm-hmm. Fucking so- No watermelons! Banana! And he's a pile of bananas, dude. Like, just the wildest shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, So let me ask you this then. How did this movie get branded as a horror and not as a comedy? God, so when you say experimental horror, I don't know enough about the period to say, but were they just unsure what horror could be like recorded? Like, is this just like, hey man, we've been writing horror for the longest time and I don't know how to present how a floating head is scary. We'll have it bite this girl on the ass. That's pretty scary, right? That'd be scary if it happened to you. All right, yeah. Yeah, it would. Like, maybe I'm just so desensitized to what horror was in the beginning because I've got these fucking, like, CGI jump scares, like, crammed into my fucking head. So remember that, like, George Orwell, like, changed storytelling and horror in a really big way when he did that, like, radio announcement for, like, the War of the Worlds, basically. Sure. People believed that was really happening. So, like, keep in mind, and that was, like, you know... This is back when people were gullible as shit? Basically, that's kind of what I'm getting at, you know? 
And, like, even today, like, that still happens, where people believed that the, uh, what was it, uh, the movie where they're out in the woods and, like, they're all doing their, their, their videotape, uh, Blair Witch Project? Blair Witch, yeah. People believed that was real. Okay. Because somebody created a website for it, and they were like, oh, shit, I guess it really did happen. That's all it took. So, okay. like, even, and that happened in, like, that happened recently. That was just a couple years back. Right. So, like, people are gullible, yes. And, like... Okay. Especially back then when there wasn't anything to compare this to. This would be considered like... This was ahead of its time. (laughs) Yeah, kind of. All right. Remember The Exorcist? Did you ever watch that one recently? Not recently, but I do remember it. Exorcist is an incredibly tame film. It doesn't... Not a whole lot happens in it. Right. You know, it's basically just these two priests like yelling at a girl for a little bit. Right, right. I think uh, I remember reading something about that where it's just like having this young girl scream like, Fuck me! Fuck me! And like, that was horrific. Yeah. The fact that it was, like, a, a girl that we would typically see as an innocent, you know, like, that was the scary part of it, basically. There were a couple of things in uh, The Exorcist that were pretty revolutionary and interesting, but, like, for the most part, looking back on it, and to have people say, like, I vomited in the movie theater, it was so scary. Like, come on. Right. It was just, there was nothing else like that at the time. People were ignorant as to what horror could be. So the floating head, the flo- the floating head... That is not only a dead person's head, but it's floating, and it talks, and it bites the girl. That's horrifying if you don't know any better. Yeah, if you're completely ignorant, you're like, damn, that's a lot. There's also, like, a lot of depictions in Japanese, like, history of, like, floating heads, like, attacking people. That's, like, a thing that they consider, like, a historical artifact of Right. No, I I do vaguely remember reading about a mythos about that, too. Yeah. So, like, it, it plays into that, but, like, to see it on screen is, like, a whole other thing, right? It's different than, like... To to have it in front of your eyes as opposed to, like, hearing the ghost story. Hearing the ghost story or, like, seeing just, like, a painting of it or something like that. Okay. And again, we run into that same problem we had with Eraserhead, where how much of this is meant to be, like, a literal... Did her legs literally fly out of that, like, lamp and then kick the cat painting and then that caused, like, the spirit to become angry? Or was the cat painting meant to, like, evoke more of a feeling? And this was just the best they could do. Mm. It should also be noted that, like... House was almost entirely made by Nobuhiko Obayashi. Did you see how short the credits were? Yeah. yeah. So much of those credits are just Nobuhiko Obayashi, you did this. Nobuhiko Obayashi did this. Nobuhiko. He he did like the practical effects, he did the directing, he did a bunch of different shit. Okay. So like a lot of the a lot of this stuff is going to end up being like this is the best someone could do when they were the one doing so many different things for this one film. Okay. You know, like the uh the backdrops a lot of times being Painted backdrops. That's what you do, you know, if if you don't have, like, a ton of people helping you, like, scout locations to get, like, a cool setting for a a given scene or whatever. Like, if it's just you, you're like, yeah, just set up a different painting for the background and we'll just film right in that. I've I've got 50 pounds of fake foliage. How can we get mileage out of this? Yeah. And there's a lot of examples of, like, people doing that across film where they're like, yeah, we're basically just going to have this one room that we film in, but we'll just change the different furniture around and we'll move, you know, uh, different things so it looks like it's different rooms these people are coming in and out of. And it's not. It's the same fucking room every time. Right. I forget what the name of the movie was that did that, but uh, I remember I remember watching a movie and thinking, like, wow, this looks like it's really similar. And then looking into the project notes for it and like, yep, sure enough, it was all the same room. Um, and that's just what you do when you you have limited resources. So there's there's that to be said for it. And, like, given all of that information, I think that, like, he does get a lot of mileage out of very little. Oh, for sure. This this is what I expect out of older horror movies. Um, at least the effects wise. Like I'm not I'm not knocking their their lack of CGI or their usage of it or anything like that. Just uh, and yeah, I guess there's a lot culturally that I, I just don't get that about like why the fake skeleton doing a jig in the background has got to be terrifying. Like, oh, you put you play music on the haunted piano and, and the skeleton dances. I'm sure there's something there that I just don't get. I will say it is there's something to be said for the like the dancing skeleton in the background as like is is the spirit of this house just mocking her? Like, I'm about to kill you. Da, 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 da. Like, right. Cause I mean it was just fun. The whole thing was fun for me. Yeah, even the parts where I was like, man, this is this is gonna get horrifying. They're playing the scary music and they're doing the jump cuts and goldfish. Yeah, so there's 
a lot of like really high kinetic energy in a lot of those scenes where it's like everything seems to be really moving fast and there's a whole lot of like lights and colors and like it's just so much all at once and like sensory overload is like I think the thing that they're going for there and that's supposed to be scary but for me it's a lot more like exhausting kind of right which like that's a feeling too like anytime a filmmaker can make you feel a feeling they're doing a pretty good job Mm. the problem here is that like the film is presented as, like, an experimental horror film, and, like, you don't really feel the horror a whole lot. Most of the time you feel sort of, like, worn down by the film, or you think it's kind of funny, or it just seems sort of, like, absurd. How do we define horror exactly? Because, like, all these things happening all at once, and a lot of them are unexpected, and a lot of them are, like, aggressive. Isn't that kind of scary in a way? For sure. I mean, I even I even really appreciate the, um... Like, at the end, where they tried to tie it all together, the, the whole little story they're reading from the diary and it's like oh and they promised each other and and it's the house that's eating them and it just devours the unwed souls of girls and and um i'm not sure i appreciate the end where it tried to be heartfelt maybe that's part of the horror of it is like this horrific thing happened but it's love and love can be horrific or maybe i'm just fucking reading too much into it no that's certainly something there and like there's you know there's a reading of this that's probably something like you know uh when you're the horrifying monster and you've killed everyone, you can kind of spin it however you like. That's fair. You can kind of say, like, oh, I, I did this out of love or whatever, you know. When the horrifying monster wins, you know, you get to say, this was because of love or this was because of... So there's there's something there. I do think it's like... Because the, even the blurb we read sort of sets up the, the creepy mom as being, like, you know, creepy. But the movie almost entirely forgets about the mom after the first, like, ten minutes. First ten minutes. She wasn't creepy at all. Like... They played her up to be creepy. And they're like, look, and she's got the ghostly shawl. And I'm like, that, there's the ghost. Like, I can already tell. And then she was dismissed. And then the whole movie, they're like, Mr. Togo's on his way. And he's got wacky antics. He, he stopped at the noodle place. He stopped at Good Noodle Man's house. And fucking was in a traffic jam and fucking turned into bananas. Like, none of that had to happen. Which, by the way, that's horrific on its own. Being turned into bananas, like... Oh, yeah. Out of all the things to be turned into, specifically, I believe, what, what was it? He was like, I don't like watermelons. What do you like? I like bananas. Then he gets turned into like a monkey's paw kind of thing. But, like, yeah, the, the, the idea that uh, Mr. Togo was going to come and save them was always, like, that was a constant reminder. We were not constantly reminded that the mom was, like, following them there. Right. So, like, when it does come up at the end, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I forgot that that's a thing. Like, does anyone still care about that? The uh, Gorgeous has, like, lured her and, like, in and, and now, like, lights her on fire. I'm assuming she hasn't married the father then. Okay, yeah. Like, you're going to be the, the mother and blah, 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 blah. Well, she wasn't yet. And what happens when the father comes? Does he also get turned into bananas, or does the house eat him? Does the house not have a taste for male flesh? I don't think that's important. I don't think that it's matters important at all. important to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I just don't think that the movie cares about it. No, no, probably not. But I think, like, maybe that's the horrific thing, is that the house will continue to eat people in whatever way it can. Oh, certainly. Like, that is, that the, is something. That you know, the house about. has its own... And what happens once it's killed or bananafied this, entirely, this entire family line? That's scary. Also... How far is the house's like present? How far does the house's presence go? If we're just going to talk about stuff the movie doesn't give a fuck about, like the house, how, how is the watermelon stand that's like clearly miles far off, away, yeah, like, like part of the the aura of the house, yeah, and the fact that not only does it affect the watermelon stand, which is insidious on its own, but also like it can actively turn a person into a pile of bananas from that far away. And I guess kill the, the the watermelon stand over. He's dead. I, I assume that he was just part of the part of the house already, because like even from the beginning, they're like oh, a spooky watermelon lamp. But it's weird that the, the house has that much range to it. Jesus Christ, it's pretty fucking far, or maybe not very far at all. I don't know, but right. I mean, they painted the backdrop. There wasn't a mile marker. The film, the film, I think has like a weird amount of like very funny like things that it wants to do. Which I think is totally good in, like, the first half of a horror film. Because it sets you up for this idea of, like, lighthearted fun, right? And if you've ever seen the trailer for House, like, it's kind of similar. Where the first part of the trailer is sort of like, hey, we're going to go to the house. And, like, we're going to go and, like, find love and, like, learn about ourselves and stuff. It's a coming-of-age story. And then by the end of it, it's very clear that things get sort of twisted during this film. And I'm like, yeah, maybe that's how they were kind of, what they were kind of going for. Like, certainly in the marketing it is, but, like... You know, in the film, you know. The, the execution, it's sort of like um, the advertisement for um, 
Martians Attack, I think it was, mm-hmm. was like huge. Like it looked like, according to all the trailers, it was like the biggest budget thing you've ever seen. And then you've got Muppets going, ack, 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 ack. and mm-hmm. I at least heard from a friend of mine that he's like, I was pissed off. I wanted my money back. Yeah. And like, that's the other thing about even Mars Attacks. Like, Mars Attacks is probably a great comparison point. Because Mars Attacks does a similar thing where it's like, it feels like it's supposed to be like political commentary, but like, you know, when the characters are being like generous, they get killed. When they're being like, oh, we're going to like, you know, go to war with these things, they get killed. So like, what is the, what is the thing you're saying is good and what are your, what is the thing you're saying is bad? Or are you just saying that like, no matter what, like, if a thing wants to kill you, it's going to kill you? Like, I don't get what the, like, takeaway for Mars Attacks was supposed to be, but it's, like, very flimsy political commentary, and I, I don't know, I, I didn't love it. At least with House, like, it does seem like it's trying to have fun, and it does that. I mean, that's the thing. I, I just, I want to make sure that I'm getting the context here, because it, like, like I said, I'm so saturated with modern quote-unquote horror that, like, the things that I thought were meant to be scary just were pretty comical. Was there any part that you thought was pretty genuinely scary? I definitely thought the piano part was super interesting in that, like, not not really the, the actual gory bits, like, which matched more current horror, um, but the, the manic side of it, where it's like, and then she continues to play the piano and is laughing the whole time. Like, I think that was pretty solidly horror. Like, I appreciated that. And the, the mirror part where it's like the, the aunt soul kind of takes, takes over gorgeous. The, the, those are like keystone moments there. Uh, their unwillingness to believe fantasy, like every single time fantasy is like, I saw a thing and you guys need to trust me. That's horrifying for me because I feel like anybody who is like, even fantasy's name is interesting, right? Cause it feels like, uh, they're like making fun of how she's sort of like ridiculous. Anybody who can see into like something greater than m- most people can see is considered like fantastical or like ridiculous and not just like a regular person who has a different perspective than you. Mm. And that's all fantasy ever was, was a person with a different perspective. And people are still like, oh, that's ridiculous fantasy. Like, what do you mean uh, uh, a floating head? Everybody has a head. Yeah, you're silly. Professor <laughs> says that, that that's not logical. That could never happen. Yeah. And, like, that's not only horrifying, but also kind of sad, you know, that, like, even her best friends, her people, her confidants, her people that she trusts the most don't, like, immediately trust her. Um, there's also a scene where Kung Fu is, like, well, so, like, bo- all, both of the scenes that involve the phone are interesting to me. When Gorgeous comes down and they're like, Gorgeous, you're fine, oh my gosh, it's good to see you, let's call the police or whatever. And she picks up the phone and you can hear, like, people, like, screaming on the other end of it. I did like those moments, as because even in the, the beginning, like, after we after they started eating the watermelon and, like, the other half of the watermelon has Fatty's voice, like, in yeah. there. Yeah, Mac. Mac. Gotta keep calling her Fatty. She was, a, she was a baddie with a fatty. She was she was truly the hero that movie deserved. Mm. But not the one that it was ready for. Apparently not. It's, God, it's, is, it's, is that the, is that the a fucking through line that we're supposed to get here is, like, horrific things can happen to you. Especially if you're slightly overweight. <laughs> Not even slightly overweight. Like, higher weight than your friends. That's it. I know. Like, she was supposed to be the fat friend. And it's like, when Marlon Brando did The Godfather, they had him, like, shove cotton balls in his mouth. So he had the fucking droopy jowl face. Mm-hmm. It's like, I really feel like that's what happened there. We gotta puff this bitch's cheeks out. Like, we, we gotta make her look so... Sum- we couldn't find a fat actress in the 70s. Who knew? And... <laughs> And we just gotta, we gotta <laughs> give this girl the dumpiest fucking romper we can and just hope people believe she's fat. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then they finally do put her in like a normal teenager's outfit of like, just like a, like a tube top and some short shorts. And she looks perfectly fine. Like, just, just fine. They're like, no, no, no. They're like, pull, pull the, pull the shorts up. We need those bloomers. Like, she's gotta have a gut that we can't see, surely. Somewhere, and, somewhere deep down. Yeah. <laughs> but nothing wrong with that shit. No. And it's, and it's crazy to me that like, and she doesn't, that's the other thing, is like, it seems like she doesn't even like it either, because she tells people, like, shut up when they're calling her fat. And right. And it's like, maybe it's like a, oh, shut up, and not like a, like a, shut up. Yeah. You know, but it does seem odd that, like, that's her, like, designator, and I get, like, this is one of those friend groups who does that. And there are people who are like, oh, hey, this is James, he's our, he's our car guy, he cares about cars, you know, we all, we right. call him wheels, you know. I you mean, know? yeah, there, there's something to be said about, like, what, what ends up being derogatory there. It's like, nowadays we can be like, the, the Japanese girl named Kung Fu? Hmm. That's, that's a little off color, don't you think? <laughs> and they're like, no, no, no. 
that the, the film was made by Japanese people, and that's her personality, is she's the kung fu girl. Just like the nerdy girl is, like, basically nerdy girl. And Yeah. Okay. Melody is the musical one. Ha ha. Yeah. No, but, like, people do do that. Like, there are friend groups who give each person a designation, and they're like, you know, hey, this is... This is wheels, and, and I'm math, because I'm really smart and good at math, and, like, this is Dumbo, because, you know, he's got big ears and he's stupid. But, you know, like, people do that, and it's fucked up and not cool. I agree with that. I think I think Kung Fu was probably the closest we'll get to racism in this movie, where it's like, Wee. For sure. I, I'd like to know what the, um, what the rationale behind Mac was, because I really feel like, because you were like, yeah, like, mac and cheese, and I'm like... No, like Big Mac. And I'm like, did they have... McDonald's surely existed in the 70s. They did. Not just in America. Surely Japan knew about Big Macs and probably had them, right? Maybe? I do not know when uh, McDonald's came to Japan. I'm not sure. I definitely don't think mac and cheese is a Japanese commonplace food item. Uh, And by 1977, Japan would be on the world stage. They'd know about macaroni and cheese. Then surely they should know about Big Macs. I just, I just want to know what the rationale is there, because they're like, it's melody, and fantasy, and mech. Like, they could have said fatty. Uh, 1971, so it's very possible. Uh, it was in Tokyo for the first time, so over the course of the next five, six years. But this years, was a, what, a 77 film or something? Yeah, so it's hard to say whether or not it would have been like a culturally significant thing, or if it just would have been... I like, feel like McDonald's, in every case it exists, is culturally significant. I mean, do you think that because, like, you're American and it's very significant here? I think that it's very... It's significant enough everywhere that this Russian-Ukraine stuff, it was a big deal that McDonald's was pulling out of Russia. In 2022, yes. But in 1971... Mind you, McDonald's came out in 1955. So when did KFC KFC end up in Japan? Because they had enough of a cultural hit to make Christmas a KFC holiday in Japan. November of 1970. I think McDonald's would be culturally significant. KFC literally turned Christmas into KFC holiday in Japan. I think by I think in the six years that McDonald's was in Japan, it would be culturally significant. Okay, I mean so. I don't think that's unreasonable. I just think that it's like a pretty big it's a it's a it's a leap. But I don't I don't know. I don't it's... think it's the biggest leap. Like I just I think I think it's Big Mac. Maybe. All right. Yeah, I I I, 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 do, I certainly think that Mac is like the most offensive character. Even though we have an Asian girl named Kung Fu, I think Mac is the most offensive because she's like the fat one. Like, and like, that's the thing, is the movie does call her the fat one. It's not just that she's shown eating all the time, and she is shown eating all the time, but specifically they go out of their way to also be like, she's fat. She's, she's a, she's a real round girl. She's so big, she looks like she would be delicious to eat. Like, there's so many times where like that comes up, and it's like, holy They're shit. They're hiking. She's eating like an entire, whatever that was. It was the world's largest rice cake or something yeah, like that. Like a huge piece of fucking, a whole giant loaf of bread. Like, Jesus Christ, back up off our girl here. And even, like, I think there's also something, what I vaguely know about Japan and, like, their stance on martial arts and stuff like that is, like, um, P- uh, like in America, black belt is something that, like, an uh, elementary schooler can get over the course of their elementary school career. And then it's like, all right, well, that's why we've got levels of black belt, and, blow, and that's why people care about that. Whereas, like, they're pretty rigid on that over there so it's like by the time you have reached college you might be a black belt if you have been rigorous and that's like your hobby maybe it matters a lot more like she she's super regimented and that's why we call her kung fu like maybe it's like not at all derogatory Mm, maybe and that was just something they just chose not to explore at all in the film like how she actually does do that outside of this. And I get it. The movie's a tight, like, 90 minutes. I think it's an hour and 27 minutes or some shit like that. Right. We we have enough time to, like, shove the stereotype in your face one time. This is fatty. This is sweets. This is gorgeous. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think that the movie would benefit from a couple of things. First of all, like, when they show you horrific things, they don't show you the people's reaction, which is, like, by this point in time, we do know that, like, showing a reaction to something is a good way to get an audience member to, like, Mimic feel, the reaction. feel similarly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of times in the movie where they, like, they discover uh, Max's hand that's been severed and put into a jar. And they're like, oh, it's a severed hand. Oh, my God, it's got Max ribbon on it. And then they don't show anybody's reaction. They just cut to the next thing. The, the few times they have reactions, it's something, like, over the top. Like, so fantasy is the only one we really see reactions from, and nobody believes her. And then, like, uh, who sees um, Melody getting chopped up by the piano and then just goes cross-eyed? Fantasy. That's fantasy. Yep. So, 
She, maybe that's supposed to be something about how she like feels like she's losing her grip on reality. Like nobody believes me, and like now I just watched this actually. That's probably the first actual gruesome thing she saw happen. Like somebody actually dying and getting chopped up. She did get to hold uh, Max's head. That's that's true. Yes, and she get to she got to watch most of uh, uh, that other girl. I well, she was getting attacked by mattresses, and I don't think like anything gruesome happened there. And I'm sure you can write off Max head and floating and then, like, biting you on the ass as, like, some sort of delirium. And then finally, she watches somebody get absolutely mangled by a piano and it's like, I'm either losing my grip on reality, which I guess is also a horrific thing. Plays into the H.P. Lovecraft thing. Yeah. Especially since, like, all of her friends are telling her, no, this is illogical. You're being That couldn't ridiculous. possibly happen, yeah. Yeah. That's another, like, kind of horror where, like, specifically your friends don't trust you. That's... It, fe- it feels almost like, uh... I always think about, like, when we're talking about George Orwell, I think about Orwellian horror, where it's, like, specifically the state is the horrific thing that's, like, controlling you and, like, you know, like, warping your... Thought crimes and stuff. You know, just all kinds of things uh, are Orwellian horror. You know, we we experience Orwellian horror every day now in 2022, you know, uh, discovering that we had a president who, like, did all this fucked up shit and, like, we're just finding out about it now, you know? Right, right. Uh, What was it? The the, the cocaine-fueled wars and such shit like that? And then also, like, you know, media services also oftentimes play into Orwellian horror where they kind of try to convince you that, like, oh, no, that's ridiculous to even suggest this or that or the other. And mm. it's like, well, then we find out not too long later. Like, yeah, no, that that's literally what happened. So I, 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 I don't think that's Orwellian horror, but it is, like, social horror in a way where it's like, you know, it's scary that you feel like you know something did happen and everyone is telling you it did not or it's impossible for it to happen. And I think it plays into, like... You know, that H.P. Lovecraft stuff of, like, this is something too horrifying to be possible, but you're seeing it happen. Right. With uh, not having the words to describe it. Yeah. But I don't think this movie was, like, really leaning into either one of those, really. I think it just worked out that way. For sure. Yeah, I definitely think that... I mean, at least, as I saw it, like, they were trying to make a horror movie. This is... (laughs) I mean, I guess in experimental horror, it's because they didn't have anybody to copy. You know, every, every... Everybody does the jump scare because it worked, but at this point in time, they were just like, I don't know, there's that old myth about the floating heads. That's kind of scary if you think about it. And, like, the idea of, like, especially towards the end where, like, Gorgeous's, like, face, like, jumps out of a fucking, like, uh, the side of the building, and then her eyes And it's bigger than everything, and yeah. yeah. All that stuff is, like, that's kind of scary, but also, like, the experimental part of it is that, like, people aren't trying this, and, like... It doesn't really work super well, right? It just kind of comes off as like, "Whoa, that seems out of place." No, right. right? So there's 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 that to be said about it for sure. I wish they had done more with the whole like, "Hey, I sent my 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 husband went off to World War Two and never came back." Thing. Got that scene by the way is great. The man fucking dies in front of him, and he's just like, "I'm stoic Japanese man." <laughs> that's 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 my whole personality. Yeah, I'm a stoic soldier of war, man. Yep. And his plane's just crashing, and he's just looking, like, a thousand yards ahead of him, just like, yep. Doesn't even show the crash, like, doesn't show it. I mean, there's probably a reason for that, given the war that they were showing, but... Well, they, they showed, what, like, an, an, an explosion that looked... They showed that after a door slammed, by the way. Yeah. Like, it was probably a full five, ten minutes after we had the expose about, like, oh, and my husband went off to World War II, and he, he never came back. And it's like... All right, cool. And then we proceed with the movie, and, and they're like, well, it'd be really weird if a cat slammed a door, and the cat slams the door, and nuke. Like, nuke goes off, or it's like... Well, they specifically say that, like, any cat can open a door, but it takes a witch's cat to close a door, and then the cat does close the door, and I think that's supposed to be the moment where, like, anybody should have been able to realize, like, hey, this is, like, really fucked up shit. But that even happens after we've already gotten the... I think the big first, like, spooky shit's happening in here moment is the uh mac dying and, and having her head like bite uh fantasy's ass uh that's kind of the big moment that lets you know like yeah yeah we're we're in a horror movie yeah now. yeah shit shit is currently happening and it's not like i mean the door closed previously too like the door closed they mentioned nothing of it the door opens and they say wow only witches cats can close door and then it closes again that was one of the cool things about the movie is how often that cat like comes up like throughout the film and you're just kind of like most of the time you're probably not even noticing it but when you do you're like god that cat sure comes up a lot and then it turns out to be the ultimate villain of the film is this fucking horrible cat spirit thing i mean wasn't uh no the cat so the cat appeared to the girl back home Mm -hmm. that wasn't her cat i mean yeah that was 
I mean, I definitely saw the cat the whole time, so that that was fun. But yeah, I think for a, a bit, I don't know at which point I stopped being like, "Oh, the uh, the new the new wife is gonna be the creepy one." Maybe it's as soon as I saw the aunt. I'm like, because when when they open the doors and she's got the super dark Rosetta shades, and it's like, okay, so she's the bad one. Maybe she's also the the, the new mother. Maybe she's the aunt and the new mother. That would have been something, right? Like, oh, her husband went off to war, and so she killed her sister and then married. Her sister's husband. So that, that could have been something. Like, they seem to be, like, hinting at it that, like, she was kind of envious of her sister for getting married after right. the whole, you know, her, her being so in such turmoil over the, the husband not returning. Or her fiancé not returning, her husband. Right. Remember. They didn't really play into that. Again, it, it, I don't know what caused him to decide, like, no, we're just going to go for these big, like, wacky set pieces that are kind of funny and sometimes kind of scary. Could, yeah, and I mean... God, there was also like the whole time they're they're finally like reading the journal and they're like, oh, and I knew he'd come back to me because he'd promise, and then they'd cut to fucking Togo uh, doing his cross country trip or whatever, and it's like that's how it's gonna end. That she's gonna marry Togo and he's gonna get eaten by the house and he's gonna spit out all the girls, and it's like that could have been something, and they're just like bananas. He's bananas now. Yeah. I actually think that's a much better way to go about it. Like, he, Togo shows up, and it seems like he saves the day for the girls, but then, like, the house actually takes him and then kicks the girls out and disappears, and, like, then, like, right? the spirit... The of, house has been satiated. Like, yeah. The spirit of the house, or the spirit of, like, the aunt, or the spirit of the aunt and Togo. They could have even done, like, a happy ending. Where right. It's like, oh, you girls brought me a man, and, like, now I can be happy, and Togo's like, oh, thank God, now I don't have to end up with one of these stupid high school girls that I'm teaching. I can end up with a real woman. Or that could have been a funny part of Togo's character, where for some reason he has really bad luck with women, and then we find out that he's, like, the reincarnation of the, the husband. Right, that's like, definitely where I thought it was leading. He's like, he'll come back to me, and then there's the scene with Togo. It's like, maybe they just didn't understand that yet? Like, I feel like that's a pretty transparent through line there but maybe that's just me in modern times and not in the 70s i think also it's you trying to put like a more like concrete like ending on the film like an actual solid wrap up here instead of just being like now nah, wacky house man yeah wacky house eat people go burr <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i think that's very much like the the ending that he wanted to have because like you're right there are like very transparently clear like yep that's a that's a good ending you just described, and it took you no time at all to come up with it. Like, you had all the pieces in front of you, and shit, man. It would have been pretty easy for them to come up with a really quick, like, oh, yeah, and then Togo's in, like, a like a, a wedding outfit, and, you know, the wedding it's outfit. All, the it's almost like they had that. to, like, go out of their way to be like, God, that Togo guy, like, all those escapades, that's really bana- bananas. <laughs> We're going to turn him into bananas. Yeah, it, did, it didn't come from his character. It didn't come from any of that stuff. It just happens. And I think that's why it's kind of funny because it's, again, that absurdist comedy where it just happens and they never really, like, explain why or, like, anything. It just did. It really also feels like it felt it like that was never planned from the beginning because that last scene where we see Togo as a, as a person, like, that, the jarring uh, cinematography choice of having to, like, the rewind and, and fast forward thing where he's hitting himself in his head, like, that was they didn't say, like, alright, now hit, love, hit your head like you're going insane. I thought he was supposed to look like a monkey, like, patting his head. That, I guess, yeah, that would have been it, too. Because he's like, oh, bananas, bananas, and, like... But they could have had him do that. Yeah, that's true. So I feel like that was an afterthought entirely. I think that also plays into the experimental nature of it, is, like, this, hey, can I use, like, a rewind and play forward and then rewind and play forward? Just to make you feel uneasy through the fact that that's not a natural motion? Yeah, and, like, then it becomes clear. Like, there were so many things where it felt like there was a very practical reason why that weird experimental effect was there. Like, when the girls were looking at each other and, like, blinking or winking one eye and then winking the other, and, it like, the camera would do that, too, so it would change... Perspective from camera A to camera B to camera A to camera B to show you what it would look like if you were winking one eye and then the other while looking at someone like, oh, you look so different out of one of my eyes than others. Like, that was like kind of cool and had a very like practical, purposeful reason for being in the film, even though it was like weird and kind of jarring. I understood why it was there and what it was doing. I wonder if like maybe that weird like rewind, unrewind effect was meant to like show the house's like influence, even the part where he, uh, Later on when he, like, or earlier on, uh, at the, towards the beginning of the film, when he's walking down the steps and he, like, falls down and all that wacky shit's happening. When that happened, the cat walked in front of him and that's when it all started. Mm. So, like, is are those weird effects that just look really odd meant to imply this is the house's effect being expressed on a person? It's a weird effect to use to, like, annotate that for the audience, but it makes sense throughout the film. Right. 
And I'm kind of always looking for those things where I'm like, why does this visual effect exist? Like, what is it trying to let us know? And I think that's very much what it is. When they use that weird, like, stop motion or the fast forward, rewind, fast forward, rewind, it's meant to let us know, like, there's some fucky ghost shit happening here. Okay. Yeah, that's solid. That's all I got to say about that. That's uh, spooky ghost shit for the sake of spooky ghost shit. Like, maybe that's also, like, part of the horror. It's like, maybe Professor's supposed to be, like, a commentary about how rational Japanese people were at the time. And to just have some shit that can't be explained. But it happened for no reason. Yeah. Scary shit happens like that sometimes. Yeah, certainly. Trying to put a reason on things is, like, part of our hubris, right? We think that we're so knowledgeable, we can figure anything out. And, like, there's something to be said for that. The problem is, is, like, we can extrapolate these things from the movie, but the movie's not actively talking about them itself. Right. Right. So, I mean, it could be none of this. This this could all be what we're putting on the movie that was just trying... Fucking, I don't know, man. Maybe the guy's like, man, I just want to make a wacky, spooky haunted house. I think a lot of it was him saying, like, I'm just going to see what works and what doesn't. And, like, ah, you know, I'll I'll put it together to the best of my ability. And this is me, like, putting my best foot forward. And, like, you know, a lot of, like, you got to cut your teeth on something, right? And, like, you know, if he wanted to do, like, a full feature film and he had the money for it and he had the time. And, you know, obviously he's doing a lot of different roles to figure out what he's good at and what he likes. You know, it makes sense. To have a lot of stuff in there that's like, this doesn't work at all. And he's just like, oh, but it could. Like, what if I tried it and people really, really liked it? Like, I can only know what I like and what the other people I've shown will like. But if it gets to a bigger audience, like, maybe more people will be like, actually, I liked all the parts that were like that weird stop motion thing. And they, they did the, the rewind and the fast forward and the rewind and the fast forward. And, like, all the parts where, like, they had all the actors, like, stand very still. And they had one actor moving, like, normally. And then everybody started moving normally again, like, to give, like, an eerie sense of, like, discomfort. I don't know. You know, you, don't, this, you did, don't know unless you try, right? Right. Did this um, did this guy make anything before this? Is this his, like, I debut? think this is his big uh, debut, like, feature-length film. Did he make anything since this? Yeah, he made a bunch of stuff since then. He, yeah? He, like, had a full career, yeah. Oh, shit. Like, notable shit? Shit that we're going to bring up in future episodes, maybe? I mean, I, I hope to do more of Nobuhiko Obayashi's stuff, but, like, let's see. I don't think any of this stuff is going to be stuff that either you or I have ever heard of. Uh, that was it. Labyrinth of Cinema was his last film. I'd love to go through this and, like, until we hit the point where he hits the hard jump. What the fuck is that? Did he make a Pokemon movie? What? This? Yeah. The island closest to heaven. <laughs> I don't think it's a Pokemon movie. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, like, go through this and just, like, stop when he starts introducing jump scares. Like, that's, that's the end of your experimentation with me. I don't but. know if he does like a ton of horror films a lot of these look kind of like slice of life type of stuff they do death at an old mansion 1975 it's older than house i bet you that's just a sequel to this one and it's look there's a cat, a cat. yeah oh, there's a watermelon in this one beijing watermelon dude what anything. if what if <laughs> this is this is the the prequel of watermelon man could be can you find out who the one white guy was can we go through the cast and find that out? <laughs> find the, the one white guy who was in uh, the Beatles. Yeah. The Japaneseles. The Japaneseles. All right, let's go cast. Auntie's fiance. That gorgeous, stoic man. Okay. What if he didn't want to be in the movie at all? He was just like, they were like, yeah, man, here's some movie. He's like, I don't want to do this. Like, Come on, man, we need somebody. And he's like, fine, fine. I'm not going to fucking care. <laughs> but I'm not going to be happy about it. I'm just going to stare off into the distance. Fuck this. <laughs> Why does Melody look so terrifying in this photo? Well, she, I think she had the most terrifying face. I feel like of all the faces, like she had the fatty face. Oh yeah, yeah. I think it was like it was a toss up between her and Mac, and Mac just got the bad roll of the coin. I know. Maybe maybe Melody just doesn't look good in the fucking uh, the short shorts because she wasn't in them at any point in the movie. She was in, she was in full blown dresses. All if anybody was covering up their body, it was Melody. Right. Yeah. Like we can't show an actual fatty. Gotta, gotta, gotta do our best to cover her. It's not funny if it's true. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're just picking on someone if it's true. God, this is actually a body horror thing, because what if people call you fat and you're like, hardly fat? <gasps> oh, damn! <laughs> the deep cut. <laughs> well, I think that's about all we've got. We'll cut it here. Yeah, no, it was fun.